Welcome to episode 13 of the V2 Academy. I'm Chris Lappin and joining me as ever, I've got Peter Prickett. Good evening, how's it going? You well? Yeah, I'm good, yourself? Yeah, very good, yep. Nothing, look good. So shortly we'll be joined by former Director of Coaching at Arsenal and author, Gerald Jones. But first, we thought we'd ask the question, just because you have good players, does that mean you're a good coach? Yeah, um... Without shocking the world, I think it could be safe to say that there's quite a few grassroots coaches out there who've got quite big egos. Yeah. Um, and great evidence of this is when they are assessed by FA uh, tutors, um, given advice on how to coach, and they do not take this well. And I've witnessed it many times because they think they are fantastic. Yeah. Because they feel that what they have done with their players on the pitch is evidence enough that what they are doing is working. So therefore they are a good coach. However, I I would ask the question, these players who are elevating their team to a high standard, how long have they been there? How Hmm. long has that particular coach worked with these players? Now, I would venture to say that if a coach has worked with a set of players from the age of eight and taken them to a high standard and players are being looked at by academies, then they probably are a good coach. Probably. Yeah. If, however, the players have come to them at the age of 14, and that's the first time I've ever seen them, how much of an influence have they had? They could have had quite a lot of influence. I mean... I've had a player who came to me at that age and he was playing as a right back at his old club and told to stay on the halfway line. At age 16, he's now a centre forward scoring 20 goals in a season. So whether my positive influence on him has been through coaching or just because I looked at him and went, nah, <laughs> we'll play you somewhere else. Yeah. No. But the likelihood is that you will have more influence on a player and his development at the younger ages than you will at the older ages. So if you were to go in and take over a, an under-16s team at a well-established grassroots club and win trophies when that's already what they were doing, are you a good coach or have you just got a set of good players? And sometimes have you just got a set of good players because your club's got the name? Yeah. There's plenty of grassroots clubs in the areas that have a reputation, so almost automatically the better players, and when I say better players, those who are playing for the counties and even those who are playing for the good school team, football teams, go to those clubs, whereas the kids who can't get in their school football team will go to another team. The Mm. kids who have barely kicked a ball will go to another team. Now, if that kid who's barely kicked a ball in in a couple of years with a coach suddenly becomes quite a good footballer, there's quite a good chance that that coach is pretty good. Yeah. And, and I think there's quite a few coaches out there who've got, whose ego is based on the fact that I work for this club. We have a partnership with a pro club and we put so many players through our system and you just go, OK, mate, great, but how long have you actually worked with these players? How much, have you, how much of a say have you actually had and they're becoming a good player or were you almost gifted a set of good players and I think the same can go in, into academies as well we um, we are all aware of Ajax and their academy yeah. and how good it is but another, and the same for Barcelona and La Masia and how good that academy is but a part of the reason it's that good is because it's Ajax and it's because it's La Masia mm. and the best kids want to go there or they recruit very aggressively. I know that Everton uh, are very, very aggressive in the way that they recruit players, and they're successful. That's not saying that the coaches aren't good, but when we talk about clubs with massive competition, uh, small catchment areas, and 
they're producing players, you start thinking coaches there must be quite good. Dinamo Zagreb are one. Monaco mm. is another one. But Monaco, I think, is the from what I've, I've seen and heard, it's the aggressive approach and also the offer of, hey kid, parents, do you fancy coming to live in Mon- Monaco? You have to pay taxes. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, okay, if I have to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so what's the evidence that someone's a good coach? What are the raw materials that they are given and what happens to them? Are you a good coach if you take a player who is already playing in an academy level and you win a few fit bits and bobs with them? Or is it real good coaching when you take a kid who can't run, can't kick a ball, can't dribble when he arrives and he gets into his school football team? Mm. Which one is a real success? Which one's a real good coach? And we're delighted to be joined on the line by Gerald Jones. How are you doing this evening, Gerald? Very good. How are you? I'm very well. So, um, those who haven't heard our previous interviews with Gerard, Gerard is a former director of coaching at Arsenal. He's an author. He's worked at Rochdale, Bradford, and is currently working in the US at Eastside FC. And, uh, and Gerard has joined us today to s- discuss dealing with parents at a grassroots level. So, Gerard, Peter, um, for our non-coaching listeners, do you have any horror stories of parents behaving badly? Or... <laughs> I've got a few. I don't know if I should say on here. <laughs> Gerard, <isn't> it? <laughs> I guess the, the one thing I want to start with, because I think it's a great topic, yeah. is, and it's never something that some, uh, that's actually taught to you as a coach. You know, I don't know any course as such, apart from maybe the Advanced Youth Award, and that was, as I've got, I've been spending maybe 10 years developing my craft. I don't know any course that's actually really looked into the detail of how do you deal with parents? How, how do you manage parents? How do you educate parents? How do you communicate with parents and I think that could be a course in itself I think it's very often a subject that's just flirted with or yeah. briefly covered to some degree and the only way you can kind of figure it out is through experience but I think parents are the most valuable asset we have in coaching and if we can get them on board and maximise them even better but you know I've got a few horror stories as I'm sure you guys will have as well uh, but the main thing is it, you know they want to feel involved I mean how do you deal with a parent that's um, you know, very enthusiastic, thinks their kid's the best thing and is constantly talking about other kids in the group, constantly talking about other kids on the team and how their kid's better than their kid. And, you know, I think they're the problems that coaches face and there's many others, isn't there? You know, why has my kid only got X number of minutes? You know, how come he hasn't got more game time in this area? Or, you know, so you're always going to face them things. I think the main thing for coaches is to make sure you've got your evidence. You can back it up and you can communicate effectively. Without dropping anyone in it, um, I'm going to use the classic line, a friend of mine, and it is <laughs> genuinely a friend of mine, their child is in a team where one of the parents is a former professional footballer. And that former professional did not conduct themselves in a way that we would um, we would encourage. Let's put it that way. And eventually they left, but not after several clashes between this ex-pro and this volunteer parent coach. So you talk about your challenges. How do you deal with that situation? As it was, the club just eventually just stood up and said, if you don't like it, Mm. you know where the door is, and they walked through the door. Have you ever felt on the have you ever felt undermined by parents shouting bad instructions at, at the side of the pitch? Or? I wouldn't use the word undermined, but I'd use the word you know it's a bit stupid. You got parents shouting press, squeeze, whatever else they're shouting. They're literally trying to control the game for you. Yeah. And listen, that happens at a lot of levels, not just grassroots. It happens in very small, minor cases in some academies. Although ca- academies tend to police it a lot better, though you know they wouldn't dare say anything. It happens week in, week out at the level that I'm working in, in America, which is, for one, you know, it's elite grassroots. Some of these kids are playing at the top level, equivalent to academies back in England. And these parents are crazy. Some parents. Yeah. Some parents. I mean, going back to the, the message that Pete was talking about, I don't know the ins and outs, so it's not fair for me to say do this, do that. But from my experience, we actually had a, I was a coach at a club, and one of the dads was an ex-pro. And his kid was getting put into a situation where he might be 
where, you know, it didn't go very well. Um, you might get them type of situations if a coach moves on and they really like that coach or whatever happens. And I think everything comes down to know your facts, be clear, you know, and you might not always agree, but making sure that you're honest and upfront with people is the most important thing. And you explain to them beforehand. So before every season starts, we do this with all our teams. We let them know who we are as the coach, but then we let them know our standards and expectations. And we say to them, I don't bother with code of conducts and all that nonsense. I just say to them, listen, I'm coaching. You pay me to do a job. I'm coaching the players. Uh, this is my belief. This is how I like to work. This is my style. But it's really important for coaches to explain to parents how they work. Because you might be a coach who's really introverted and really quiet. And they might see that as sign as you're not coaching, when actually it's just your personality and perhaps you're wanting them to develop their own decisions. Mm. And that's coaching. But they might use that as a opportunity because they'll see you as vulnerable to speak and coach from the side because you're not. So I think it's important you don't get into as many problems further down the line if you explain to people how you are. Me, I like the players to make their own decisions, but I am quite a vocal coach. I'm a little bit more of a demand type of guy so I might be a little bit more vocal than others doesn't mean I'm always going to coach on the side but it means that I will have a voice and they know that whereas someone else they might be quiet so I think it's important to first explain your style and then explain to them you know what your objectives are and what your expectations are for the season for them for you for everyone and then everyone knows where you stand and we always say to them we, do, we have no problem with you giving information as long as it's not coaching information. If it's praise or it's reinforcing a message that we've worked on, for example, Jimmy's going down the outside, he beats the player, he's a number seven, he puts a cross in and we score from it, or he just puts a cross in, that could be part of his learning objective, and I might have shared that with the parent. I don't mind the parent saying, go on, be positive, 1v1. That, I've got no problems with that. If the parent's saying, get at him, no, don't pass, dribble, go down the line. Right, I've got a problem with that. Because now you're telling him what children are taught from an early age that they have to do what their dad tells them so is it, is it a hard thing for the players to ignore once it
Yeah. You know, it's that sign of approval, isn't it? And you, you want your dad to give you that smile or that thumbs up. And I think that's quite powerful. I think what's important for people listening is not to think, you know, if the parents are talking, hey, shut up, type of thing. Because <laughs> I do think, although we don't want, and this is the point Peter was making, we don't want them to be looking over to the side and looking for that instruction or that reward or whatever all the time, you know, from the coach or the, or the parent. We want them to be able to figure it out themselves and make their own decisions. Otherwise, it's like playing FIFA. You, know, you might as well play the game for your joystick in it, aren't you? As I say. But I think what's really important for people to know is how do we work with parents so that they can feel a part of that experience and support the player? That's the most, that's my biggest question. I don't know if you guys have got any ideas, but what we do is we will get them to use certain terminologies that we use or reinforce the actions that we're saying are important. So, for example, we might have a game and I might walk over and across the field and say, guys, listen, we're focusing on this today. This is one of the strategies that we're going to work on. So if you see this type of behaviour, please encourage it. Yeah. Uh, if we win the ball here, yeah. we're looking to break out. So you're keeping them in the learning process. And, you know, it's a little bit of a give and take. I don't think it's fair if a parent goes to a game and, the, and they're expected to watch that game for the whole however many minutes and keep the mouth shut. I don't think that's fair. So I think what we've got to be better at is giving them a voice, but in the right manner. So again, and it's a very, it's got to be black and white. It can't have a grey area, you know, where you're saying, well, because the parents will say, well, you told me I could say something. You know, it's got to be, this is instruction time. We want them to figure it out themselves. We don't want you to start telling them, pass out, kick it, whatever. But if you see them doing a behaviour that, that's important to their journey, we want you to reinforce that message. So, for example, my parents will shout, great surfing. Go on, Danielle, surf, surf, great surfing, which means be patient, 1v1 uh, body shapes. She loves it, and the crowd loves it, and I love it. You know, she's not saying, Danielle, go win the ball, close her down. She's yeah. not saying that. She's reinforcing the behaviour. And I think that's what's important for people to listen is, at any level that you're working at, how can we get them more involved? You know, and it's interesting, I don't know what you're got, you all got to feel about that, what I just said, if you agree or disagree? I think, well, I, I mentioned earlier um, contradictory messages. So as, if the parents are understanding of exactly what you're trying to do, then they will know what to praise. If they know that you as a coach are not looking for the ball to be smashed long, then you don't want them praising that. They'll understand that as long as they know. If you're looking for short, sharp, fast passing, and when it happens, it gets a ripple or it gets a shout of great play, I'm perfectly happy with that. It's got to, what they say has to chime with what the coach says. And if it doesn't, we just get, as I said, a mixed bag, some confused kids, and a, almost a, a tug of war between head parent and coach. I agree with that. I agree with that, 100%. And the problem I have with one of my teams is uh, a parent played at an alright level, probably thinks I know a lot about the game, you know, has played it quite competently, still plays it as an adult, and he feels that he can tell the kid what to do, and I imagine sometimes he might think, maybe I'm giving the wrong information, and this player needs to be doing this instead of this, and things like that, and I think you might always run into that, because what we can't control is other people's egos, or their uh, personalities, but what we can control is our environment and as you said that clarity of what the messages are that we're on the same page we do a lot of work with it I, I mean we did a parent education night where we literally brought all the parents in across the club and gave them an opportunity to speak and we also gave them powerpoints and we showed them this is what's important to us at U7 because a lot of the parents and we've got one in particular who can get a bit crazy at times and it's like ah you know, why are they winning? They got beat 2010. You know, it's a, you know, it's a disaster. And, or why aren't they kicking? And, you know, all this type of stuff. And they were adamant they did not agree with 4v4. They thought it was, it was wrong, right? Yeah. And other clubs are doing 7v7 and blah, 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 blah. And in the end, after this education night, and obviously what's helped is after the season, you know, this parent has actually seen how the kids have progressed over the fall and winter period. And now they're like, you know what, I wasn't sold on it at first, but now I am. And I think that's important, is that education. Clubs listening to this and coaches listening to this need to spend more time with the parents, as best as they can, informing them what they're doing and why. I must have had five or six meetings with the U7s over a period of time as a group, and some more on an individual basis, reinforcing why we do what we do. Why we place certain emphasis on this in training and not this. Why this isn't as 
lot of the time they might come back and they disagree. But then you're batting it back and you're reaffirming it, you're sticking to your guns and, you know, you, you're telling them and it's a consistent message. And I think that's the most important thing is that relationship with them. And it builds a lot of trust, you know, and then over time they buy into it. And if they don't, well, it's a case of, you know, how are we going to work this? Because I'm trying to get the best out of your child, your son or your daughter. If you're going to constantly give the wrong messages, reinforce the wrong messages in the car journey home, etc., this ain't going to work because you want the best for your kid. And I'll argue this with anyone, no matter how deranged some people can be, a mum and a dad wants the best for their child. They might not always be well educated, but in theory they should want the best for their child. Yeah. So with that in mind, I think we've got to make sure that we, we go an extra mile, you know, educating them and working with them. And it's no different to what schools do. Schools do exactly the same thing. Which is better, I'll use the word better loosely here, a parent with no knowledge of the game or a parent with a lot of knowledge of the game, which is easier to deal with at grassroots and youth level. I don't know, because it... I don't know if it's a straightforward answer. I know what you're alluding to, but I don't know if it's straightforward. Because you can get someone who doesn't understand the thing and they could think they know everything and cause a problem. Or, you know, you've got the blank canvas and you can educate them. Whereas if you've got someone who knows a lot, they're going to come back at you with more answers and more questions. We had a guy, I was an academy coach at one of my last clubs, and a parent came to the academy coach, not me, it was the year group below me. I remember the, the situation. And his kid... Uh, was getting released and he basically said that he knew more about coaching than the uh, coach because he read the module three pack and he <laughs> read the youth award and he understands what the FA are trying to say <laughs> and I just thought that was ridiculous you know because I've read a book or something online I know more than you so I, I, I think that's a problem I, I don't know if there's a straightforward answer I think that's a problem with people on the internet <laughs> Yeah. Podcasts, you know, you'll get parents listening to this, and hopefully, you know, everything YouTube, you can be an expert to some degree now, you know, because the game is broken down into a lot of detail now, more than it probably was before. So people can be little miniature experts, you know, if they watch Monday Night Football and they're listening to what people are saying, and then all of a sudden, they're like, oh yeah, I get that, you know. Um, I'll tell you what's important is the car journey home. If we give the parents. So the key, the key for what I've got from the conversation is to get the parents on the side where long-term player development is not relegated it's at the expense of hoof football and pressure to win at all costs when development is the key. Yeah. And it's not easy, is it? <laughs> it sounds easy on this podcast, but it's not easy. You know? It, no, it, takes, it takes bravery. Um, it does. It really does. Because I, I sat down and had the, this conversation with a group of coaches at the club and I asked the question is our job to win football matches? The answer is not really. Our job is to improve the players and hopefully with that comes winning games. Hmm. Do the parents understand that are under eight our job is not necessarily to win football matches? Maybe, maybe not. And we need to be brave enough to lose a game or two and deal with whatever comes our way. It's a powerful, that's a powerful statement because it's important for coaches to know, I mean I always say this, it's easy when you're winning because nobody says anything. Mm. As soon as you lose in, everyone questions everything and it's hard because, you know, winning doesn't mean that you're doing things right but when you're winning the parents sort of buy into what you're doing. Yeah. Whereas if you're losing but you're saying it ain't important and then you get drummed 12 nothing at the weekend 
that. I think, I think we'll let you back, get back to work now, Gerald. <laughs> so, um, so before we go, do you want to plug your social media? And Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you feel free to follow us on Twitter, Gerard underscore Jones, at, uh, sorry, at Gerard underscore Jones, and, you know, follow us on, uh, on websites, everything, so on, you know, www.gerardschoolfootball.com website I'm always flexible I'm always willing to help people out yep. um, if anyone wants to get in touch feel free yep. uh, all the links will be in the description below this article so I've really enjoyed speaking to them I'm sure Peter has today as well and would love to have you on again in the future thank you right, so huge thanks to Gerard um, he said he'll be back on in a few weeks so we look forward to that um, next week we'll be joined by Northern Ireland's first team futsal assistant manager, Garth Smith. So it's our futsal special, which you're, I'm sure you're very excited for, Peter. Yes, indeed. Always like the bit of futsal. <laughs> right. Well, have a good week. Good night.